have. Are you having problems with your vintage Heath kit scope? Well, I've got one here on the bench that has some strange issues. It's a factory built SO4510 dual trace scope. The issue is some noise on the trace and the trigger mode does not appear to be working. So let me give you a close up and I think I know what's wrong. Here she is idling. I have no signal applied and the input is at ground. So there's my vertical position, there's my horizontal position, but if you take a look, there's noise in that trace. That thing should be dead nuts straight line at this point. There's some fluctuations and a little beacon going on over here. I don't know what that is, but I can see some strange patterns in that trace. So my guess is bad filter caps. So this scope was made in 1974, actually at the factory. This is not a kit. This one was factory built, which is very cool. Probably worth saving. But as you can see, there's like a mega pile of capacitors underneath. Your high voltage caps are over here. There's low voltage supplies. I suspect these electrolytics are defective and I've got them on hand. So like I do with my guitar amps, let's change the caps. So Heathkit did it right when they built these. Everything is modulized, so they actually plug in to the chassis, okay? So before you pull the board, obviously make sure the caps are discharged. There could be up to 3,000 volts at this point where the anode is going up to the tube. So I'm pretty much going to unplug this stuff. I have already verified it's dead. Take out some screws and this board will unplug. So easy maintenance. All right, I took out the four screws and there's a couple little nylon restraints here but I noticed they don't seem to be going to anything. Probably broken. So the board's out. There's the bottom side. Nothing alarming. So I'm going to go ahead and change the caps, inspect it, we'll put it back in and try it. So you find some of these capacitors are odd values. You don't have to hit it right on the money. For example, these 6,000 microfarad at 16s. I'm going to put in these 5,600 microfarad at 16s. These say 2,500 at 25 volt, and I'm going to replace it with these 2,200s at 25 volts. So the big 2200 microfarad caps are installed and you can see here this is one of the new radio mount type that I'm replacing those gigantic 6000 microfarads with. So the positive shoots down then I have a ground runner going over the top. When I get done we'll zip tie these down so they're nice and secure. All right, there's the old ones, there's the new ones, mostly radio mounts. I did have some axial mounts for the 2200 microfarads, but the other ones lay right down. Just use your little runner. I'm going to fire it up, but first I'm going to make absolutely sure that I have the polarity correct. I'll inspect the bottom of the board, plug it in, let's see if the problem goes away. So the board is temporarily reinstalled. I've noticed, if you watch, the center of this board springs quite a bit. So these connections and obviously have issues with that. So before I permanently call this job good, I need to find a way to support the center of that board better so it doesn't try to bow, especially in shipping. Here we go, initial power up. I'm gonna kill the shop lights. So maybe we can see it a little bit better. Notice that the power light's not working, but it's obviously on because you can see the little graticule thing come on there. So let's see what we get. There's the trace. There's my intensity. Got a lot of intensity. So right off the bat, I notice that the trace is much sharper and the bump, bump, bump is gone. Looks pretty darn good. All right, so the next thing I want to do is hook up the calibrator and see if that looks good. Nice square wave and make sure the triggering works. All right, here's the calibrator running. See, so I can change my time, all that good stuff. It's 
triggering in there. I'm hearing a little bit of high voltage arcing. Something else I need to take a look at. Maybe the anode cap is a little bit loose. But the other issue I was having is triggering. So I've got all the caps secured with tie straps. And the ones that didn't have tie straps, I put some adhesive to make sure everything doesn't move. Now this board needs to be reinstalled, but there is an issue with the installation of this board into this scope and all of this series of Heathkit scopes. Let me show you what's going on. So this board seats in here and you line up these Molex type connectors. You push it in. There's four screws on the corners that held it. And they had this post in the middle that back in the day used to lock into the chassis when you pushed it. But unfortunately that's wore out. So what happens is the board bows here in the center and these connections remain loose. Okay, They will not lock in and you'll have poor connections which will cause all kinds of issues with the scope. Well here's the fix. What I'm going to do is install this stud. Okay. So this screw is going to come in from the back side with a quarter inch spacer. Then the board will seat over that stud and I'll have a nut and I'll be able to pull that board right down against the terminals and that'll be a permanent fix. All right, there's the spacers installed with a little washer to pretty much line it right up with the nylon. Okay, we don't want it too far back. Because I don't want to break these connectors. They're old and brittle. So now I'll get the board in place. Get the nuts on there. But hey, guess what? I got to take these nylon things off first, don't I? So let me get those out of the way. So in case you're wondering, right there is one hole. And right there is the other. They're on the ground path. And that same ground path goes over here through this connector and does actually ground to the chassis. So those did not need to be insulated standoffs. So let's get the board on. All right, the board's in place. Those screws came right on through. By the way, I used number six screws, one inch long with quarter inch aluminum spacers. So I get these screws in, we get these in, and this thing should be permanently and securely mounted. All right, so you can see installation complete with the new studs. And now I'm just going to buzz out the supplies real quick. But I'm sure we're good to go. Of course, Heath Kit's really cool how they design things because they actually have the voltage test points right on the board. There's negative 15, positive 15, so here's a better view of the terminals with the power supplies identified. You can see your plus five here. There's a negative five here. And I already did the 15s. There are some other power supplies, but you have to refer to those in your manual. Just stay away from the 3000 volts that feeds the CRT. So that's a wrap on the power supply repair of the Heathkit SO4510 oscilloscope. You may be wondering, Terry, why are you spending all this time repairing a worthless scope like that? Well, okay, a little history for you. When I was a kid, I used to get those heat kit catalogs and I'd drool over the oscilloscopes. I always wanted one, but my dad couldn't afford it. Because back then, in 1974, this scope sold for $750. That's like $4,000 today, guys. That's like a weekend trip for Marsha at Kohl's. Get Not shoes, shoes. Maybe designer jeans. I don't know. Maybe, Maybe wine for you. They don't sell wine at Kohl's. That's what I <laughs> spend my money on. Okay. Anyway, that's why I'm doing it. Because I want to preserve the history and keep the scope working for future generations technicians. It's still a great scope for audio work and general purpose troubleshooting okay you can't use this thing like to monitor somebody's heart but you sure can use it to trace signals in old vintage amplifiers so we'll see you in part two on the trigger repair